well, it's hide and it's hide and go seek, isn't it? But it's it's hide and go. You know how it is, sir. It's just copying them what lives in the woods. That's the game. We play the game of bear, and when the bear comes, he gets close to you and he screams and he gets you if you don't turn in time. The Apocalypse Players present A Christmas Inheritance, a Call of Cthulhu 7th edition scenario by Dan McAleer in the style of M.R. James, with Joseph Chance as Edward Caster, Dan Wheeler as Reverend Peregrine McCutcheon, Dominic Allen as Sidney Wagner, and Dana McAleer as the Keeper of Arcane Law. Part 3. Two Kings. That's the game of bear, and usually about the town is, it's fine, but oh, what with... And he's sort of, he's finding bits of saying this difficult. It's clear he's only saying it because of hypnosis. The other kids have also backed away. You can trust my voice. Trust my voice. And he says, uh, just old Grizzly, because of old Grizzly and, and, and the rest of them. And, and the last I saw him was, and we knew it was meant to just be the woods and he went into the maze, sir. He went into the maze and something snatched him, mister. Something flattered him and folded him up, as I reckon. And his his eyes went and and the kid sort of just like... Now, all right, it. what's going on here? What about the quorum, gentlemen? And three, two, one, you're awake. <laughs> I, you're back in the William, room. <laughs> this young lady, does she needs some sort of vitals. And gentlemen, would you be so kind as to make sure that child is safe or at least knows where it's going... Yes, I think the child. I think the child should come inside and have a cup of hot cocoa, and I think Mrs. Ladyship here must get a, a, a must stiff a drink, and I think we should all convene in the library, and discuss discuss something very worrying. Look, as sympathetic as I am to Prince Kropotkin's theories, I, I do not want anarchy in my home on the evening well, exactly. that I arrive, Sydney. Exactly. The young boy, I'm sure, has a home to go to. Do you, boy, have a home to go to? Oh, well, he, he seems... Now that the thing's been broken, it's taken too much out of him, and he's just like a sort of shivering, crying mess. The other, the other children have all vanished. They've, they've melted back off into the darkness. He at least needs a hot cocoa. I mean, look at the stage. <laughs> he's going to, he's going to get, catch his death. Good thinking, Wagner. Um, William, is there, a, is, there a, is there a lady in the house who could make some cocoa? William sort of uh, steps forward and sort of mildly says, oh, I can make the cocoa for you, so don't you worry about that. Well, is, it just, is it just us now, William? Uh, I, well, it is since uh, Ainsworth sent the staff for the night. Then they're and all gone. They'll, yes. they'll all be back tomorrow, I'm sure. Well, no, 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 that's the right decision. And this, this, this lady, I was about to say young lady. Sorry, madam? She's, uh, she looks about sort of 40. This young lady. What's your... Um, <clears throat> Hello, my name's Kester. Um, I'm... I'm here at the house. Uh, she looks slightly calmed from having been talking to William. He seems to have worked some calm upon her. The opposite of what Dom's done to the child. <laughs> William, do do help that child, will you? Oh, I see. Um, well, it's just my son Samuel, sir. I was explaining to the gentleman he's he's gone missing, and the lo- his friends and the local kids said the the last place he'd be seen was up here at the the house. So. I, uh, I'm sorry, sir. I shouldn't have disturbed no, you. No, not at all. Why you're so you new in? to the area and not everything. Not at all. Why don't you come in? Let's let's all go inside. We've got warm drinks. Well, if you're sure, sir. Oh, absolutely, I insist. I insist. It's the least that we can do. Isn't that right, Peregrine? Uh, that's right. I think we should all get in, get inside. Certainly. As you're walking up to the door, she sort of suddenly comes to and looks down at um, the kid, the child, and says, uh, "Oh no, no, no." No, 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 he must be getting back to his home. He, his parents will be worried sick about him. I, I'll bring him home. If you if you promise to look out for my Samuel, I, I must get him home. We can't have more than one child going missing of an evening. And if not, his parents will be as worried as I've been. And she starts sort of breaking down slightly again. Maybe we could maybe we could at least wrap something up for them, something something to eat, something hot to get them home. 
William Maybe sort of have... says, oh, of course, sir, of course, and he rushes. Something, whatever you cooked us for dinner, I'm sure you can spare some of it for them. Capital idea. And here's a shilling for both of you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, the kid sort of completely loses his tears for a second. It's like... <laughs> and then, like, of, you know, it's not completely cynical. He does go back to him. <laughs> Judith sort of doesn't really take in what you're saying. Um, and just... we, w- Madam, you have my word as... Uh, a psychical researcher, for whatever worth that is, that I will stop at nothing to find your child. Thank you, sir. Thank you, I sir. I will, if necessary, commune with vibrations beyond the material world to do it. What is the child's name? Well, uh, Samuel. 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 Samuel, yes, of course. Samuel is. Martins. Martins I, I'm, thank you. I'm Judith Martins. And he's my youngest, Samuel Martins. He's, only, he's, he's but nine, but... He's a, he's a sensible lad and he shouldn't have been away this long. Mrs Martin, this may sound odd. Do you have anything personal of Samuel's? A lock of hair? A uh, scrap of clothing? Well, anything like that? No, well, Something impersonal to him or precious to him? A marble? I don't... Well, I... No, I, I don't say as I, I do, sir. I'm sorry. I may do at home if it would help. And she looks quite desperate. Mm. Uh, Come by tomorrow if you find anything. Yes. They've proved useful as a psychic locus. Oh, yes, uh, psychic locusts, yes. And she, uh, she sort of... Uh, and as, as you're talking, William hurries back out and he's got a sort of bundle, a sort of a hobo a bag. bag of uh, <laughs> sort of cold cuts and a, a couple of little chunks of cheese. And he sort of... Uh, he has a couple of little uh, sort of miniature thimbles of the mulled wine, sort of, so we'll get that down here to warm you, and are you sure you'll be all right walking back on your own? Judith sort of, oh, yes, we'll be fine. Come on, you. And the kid sort of uh, doesn't really respond to her, but just sort of starts walking alongside her, um, and they sort of, unless they stop, they, off they go, down the drive. Um, uh... Peregrine just takes a moment to uh, thinking, oh, this is probably the sort of thing that I'm expected to do. He takes out the Bible and just as they leave, he just touches them both, holds the Bible very visibly and says, uh, go with God, go with God and watches them to see whether they react in any unusual way. The the, the child sort of react. he sort of goes dead behind the eyes again. But it's not like boredom, it's like something... Seems almost a defence mechanism, I suppose, but it's just it's the same way you've seen the the children react when you've mentioned anything of sort of any import or philosophy at all before. Just right. a sort of like a, t- a, a sort of switching off as soon as they don't understand what's happening. Um, and Judith sort of makes the sort of the oh well yes and sort of does a little cross a genu- genuflection <laughs> a genuflection. Um, but again, it seems. Relatively clumsy. Okay. Well, gen- gentlemen, shall we withdraw f- for these drinks? And uh, Aye, I think we should get it. Get in by that fire. The uh, the main study is uh, upstairs. There's a few libraries down on the the ground floor, but the main study used by a uh, well, Master Caldwell, when God rest his soul, when he he was in charge, uh, and that that's where I, Mr. Ainsworth said he'd left the papers and all. So uh, I've started a fire going in the grate. Um, you'll we take a look at those papers, do you let think? Us, let um, us withdraw to the study. Excellent. You, you'll find it... Uh, you go up the left-hand side of the, the staircase this time, and it, it'll be on your left. You, you'll see the glow from the door, sir, because I, I started a fire in the grate. Well, there's a bell up there, I take it. Oh, of course, sir. Mm, very kind, William. Excellent. Uh, anything else I can get you while you adjourned? I think not, gentlemen. A gin, please. Excellent. Well, well, uh, there's a liquor cabinet up there in the study, of course. Sir. I'm already going up. It's there. all up. To, it's all yours now. And he sort of uh, my yeah. capuchon flapping in, in in with my haste. So you make your way up to the study. So you go up the uh, the left hand side of the staircase and make your way along. You can see the glow emanating from the sort of half open door, and you uh, you make your way in. Um, it's it's the only room in the house you've been in which sort of gives the impression of uh, regular use um, or warmth. Um, there's a fire in the grate, and as soon as you walk in the room itself, it's sort of the angles are strange because of the shadows only emanating from the fire. But it's it's busy with papers and books and dust sheets and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, low fire burning, and uh, there's a central desk which seems cluttered. Um, even the chair has a. 
books and papers piled upon it. Um, so yes, um, here you are. Cluster around the fire, find the spirits, or look for the papers, or look for anything else. Well, the first thing I'll say as we enter is, gentlemen, I spoke to the boy who saw that child go missing, and he said, under, I have to admit, under hypnosis... Good God. He said that he, this cheese is good, isn't it? Um, he, he talked about the cheese? No, no. He said that he was, um, <clears throat> he was playing... They were playing a game of hide-and-seek called Bear... I'm not familiar with it, but I think they spook each other. Anyway, um, he was rambling about the grizzly. Old grizzly came and got them, and uh, young um, Samuel went and hid in the maze, which he wasn't supposed to go into. And then he said he got folded in half. And that's when he, the last time he saw him. What do you make of that? I feel like we should probably scour the maze, either tonight or in the first light. He, he well, got folded in half. Is what he said. I um may have been a manifestation of his subconscious that he couldn't put into words because he was under hypnosis. I overheard that conversation you had where he mentioned playing the game called Bear. Oh yes, you you know it? Uh, n- no, but um, something came to my mind when I was upstairs, and I I felt compelled to uh, reach for my Bible, and and t- to my shame, I I don't consult it as often as perhaps I should, but I came across a passage. Maybe I should read it to you and see if Mm. it stirs anything in you as it did me. Please do, Perry. It's from um, Two Kings. Before you do, remind me again what instigated this, uh, what made you want to look in the Bible? Just a feeling. The... the sight, the sight of the children gathered outside, huh? The, it was also, uh, just to jog your memory, since it was me that instigated mm. that, um, go up, you bald head, go up, you yes, bald head. Yes, it was. Was what you heard the children shouting at Leaf. I, I, I've been feeling a little uneasy ever since then. This preyed on my mind, the, the, the chants of the children, and... Uh, but seeing them all gathered outside in the half-light made me reach for the Bible. And the passage I found is this, 2 Kings 2, 23, 2, 24. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. Now, it's a Bible passage. They're all parables. They're all... um... Well, exactly. They're parables. They're meant to be interpreted. They're not meant to be literally what's (laughs) happening. Of course, of course. And uh, and that's absolutely... That's what I'm saying to you. But perhaps maybe these boys have uh, interpreted it a bit too literally. And the game they play is... uh... No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You are a minister of the cloth and you had to go and look it up in the Bible. Why do you think these children would know an obscure passage like that? Well, that's a, a, a very good question and, and um, I, you know, I don't want to pr- pr- pretend to understand why, but the phrase, go up, you bald head, I, I would suggest is quite an obscure one and it's unlikely that they coincidentally said the same thing that is written in this passage. Well, you see, that's not what disturbs me. That could easily be explained by being a, a sort of something that's slipped into folklore that has become a local expression taken from the Bible. What disturbs me more is the parallel with the bears. He did say that old Grizzly came and folded them in half and pulled him to pieces. And do you think it's a coincidence that both these things appear in the same passage? Well, that's what... That's what has, quite frankly, unmanned me, uh, Mr McCatchen. I think I need to sit down. I, I, I say, I think I need to sit down, and I walk to the drinks cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> there's, a, there's a small sort of... Uh... Mahogany and glass cabinet over by the right hand side of the fire grate, and it's got a selection of ports and spirits. Is, is this a, is, the, is there a library in the study? Yes, as well? uh, the walls are almost entirely books. 
I should have stated. Um, um, yeah. I, can I see if I can find a, uh, a, a like a natural history section? Are you using a library mm. role, maybe? Yeah, yeah, please. W- while he's doing that, I say, I say to myself, "Quius est solum, eos est usque ad coelum et ad infernos." And then I and then I muster to myself, Who, "Whosoever is the soil, it is his up to the sky and down to the depths of the earth." As above, so below. Hmm. Hmm. And I and I sit with some papers in my hand, but I don't read them. I um, succeeded my library roll. So, your library roll. Um, I'm assuming, like you, you, you're all taking a drink. You're sort of taking a time in the room. Yeah. Um, so if you're sort of just going for, it, you've got a successful library roll. You're looking for natural world. Um, Specifically, a- I'm looking for something about the natural history of this very specific location. Okay. Unfortunately, there's nothing that seems to be directly linked to this particular area. But what okay. what your success does yield is looking through the sort of the spines of the books and the the sort of the titles. There's a lot of Latin, a lot of books in Latin, a lot of it's mainly history. It seems some archaeology, uh, sorry, architecture, but mainly history. Um, and the histories seem to be primarily Roman. Well, Latin, obviously. Um, there's there's a section which is bigger than you've ever seen, which seems to be on Saturnalia. There's a uh, yes. There's there's some books on sort of pre-Roman Brittany, and even a couple on sort of Norse mythology and uh, various European uh, myths. But um, there's a lot of Latin. Um, there's nothing on the Ooh. history of the actual area. Okay, uh, chaps, players. Um, I've got really, I've got really good Latin. I've got solid Latin, but not. But I, but I don't know. I mean, I can't read the whole library. I think eventually I snap out of my slight funk, and I, I begin as I see you engaging more and more with various books. Mm. I begin to engage, and, and I think um, we start a conversation. Ned, there's. Uh... There's a remarkable collection of books on Saturnalia and, uh, well, quite a lot of Roman history in general. I mean, I don't know whether there's anything here that might throw any light on what we've just experienced. Are you suggesting a sort of sort of Saturnalia and its local traditions? Uh, perhaps. It's not really my area. My, my, my Latin is more ch- church Latin and botanical Latin, I'll be honest. But um, I feel confident I could translate anything that's here um, mine is pig latin <laughs> <laughs> but mine is uh, moderate to good but but perhaps i should just cast my eye over these papers see if coldwell left anything of any import that's a good idea maybe he'll, maybe there'll be some evidence of what this collection refers to so you're searching the uh, the desk I, I i'll start there but i'm very keen so i'm, I'm almost distracted right. by the idea of these tomes on local so, roman history so for you peregrine um as you're as you're looking through obviously there's there's a whole library of books so it'd be impossible mm. for you to you know but um you you could always do a sort of spot hidden to see what the most well-read ones are the wealth um, the like the prominent books are or um and while you're doing that um edward um you're going through the papers on the uh, the desk i assume sydney is uh Helping himself to the gin, uh, mm. unless you're feeling like anything else. Um, um, does the win- What does the window overlook from this room? There is no window in this room. Oh right, it's probably the only room. It's on. It's on the back side of the house, mm. um, on the, the sort of the left wing. It would look over the sort of extremities of the herb garden, probably as in Peregrine's window, but it, um, there's no window. The fireplaces. So I, I rolled against my spot hidden and rolled a success, but then I actually changed my mind um, and I, I rolled against my intelligence, I rolled an idea roll and I'm too off an extreme success. So I'm going to spend a bit of luck. Right. Um, and, and use my, if it's all right with you, use mm. my extreme idea success to uh, um, have a little a brainwave at, at, at which book, as you suggest very kindly, keeper um which one looks maybe well thumbed or uh most interesting 
So it's, it, I, I think it's, it's less what's well thumbed because you have to go through every book individually, but it's more what's prominent in the cases, yeah. what's left to the back of the room and what, what, what is there particularly. And um, you notice that um, the most sort of prominent books seem to be, strangely, although they're, they're, they're lesser in terms of their quantity, in terms, you know, compared to the Roman Latin histories, the books on pre-Roman Britons and uh, Norse mythology. Meanwhile, um, Edward, your uh, your search is on the desk, uh, yielding various things, but um, none of them yet seem like the uh, the papers which uh, you were uh, meant to double sign for. An even for even with the. Um insights that my significant law skill might provide your significant law law skill, law skill. oh law skill <laughs> I was going to say I don't think there's anything Norse about the uh... we should swap if you've got the Norse skill you should come <laughs> yeah. and look at these books uh, swap over um, no um, with your law skill you sort of see there's scribblings there's things about um, um, Thomas's estate and things like that but it seems to be mainly from uh, when they were trying to find you I suppose, and there's nothing quite concrete, but there's various pages of sort of scribbling, sort of looking at the the old Caldwells and how they might have interlinked with your family. Um, but there's there's nothing in the way of contracts, which I you've already signed the initial papers with Ainsworth, and the reason for you meeting here was not only to look over the grounds and meet the staff, etc., but to sort of initial and finish off the uh, the sealed documents. Um, yes. You can't find anything of that nature to hand. Well, no. Good. So, so um, it's, I mean, I am literally going to be very, uh, uh, very dismissive of, of of the task unless I see anything that my legal mind says this is this is important. There's nothing. The only thing you get a sense of is the sense that it seems the Caldwells are a very isolated family tree. There's uh, there's very little branches over the last hundred or so years, certainly. Um, so your connection with them... I mean, you'd never heard of the Caldwells, so your connection going back obviously would have been distant. But that's not unheard of in aristocracy, you know, sort of an entire line sort of dying away or or going abroad or disappearing. And, you know, it's, yes. it's still lucky, but um, there's no... Uh, yeah, there's no clue... As to as to that, it seems they had to look for quite a while to find you. Um, meanwhile, Sydney, mm. while you're sort of drinking over by the fire, do you want to give me a spot hidden? Oh yeah, I was going to say I'd also like, it, depending on how this comes out, mm. co- I'm contemplating ringing the bell to speak to. Um, oh yes, I, f- I keep forgetting his name. William. 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 William Purdue. William Purdue. Oh dear, oh dear. That that's a ninety-five on the spot hidden. But you know what? I think um You stare into the flames and go blind. <laughs> I've got a one in two chance, so I think I'm gonna push the roll. Yeah, uh, fuck if it. I can. Um I shall push the roll by um I shall I shall st- I shall try and give I'm trying to have a look around the room. something something's something's bothering me, so I'm gonna stand a bit closer to the fire. Mm. Well, that's a good. That's a good choice because actually, because it's the one point of light, everything else seems a bit dim and quite vague. Yeah. Well, it looks close to the fire. God knows what's there, but at least there's some illumination. You can get yeah. some sense of clarity. Pro- probably a bit too close to the fire. Like I'm bending over to sort of warm my face, and I'm, I, you know, it would only take. It would only take a. I am quite a clumsy person. It would only take a little bit to push me over into the... Into <laughs> and the you die with your head on fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's an invitation to a keeper, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> your scarves and hats catch in the flame. That's a hard success. Oh. High success. So, um, as you sort of... Uh, you've imbibed a, a couple of gins, and the others have been quite quiet. You know, Peregrine's sort of rummaging amongst the shelves and sort of being quite careful with the dust covers and and uh well edward's not particularly being careful but he's sort of leafing through these papers and it's sort of become white noise to you mm. you just sort of you feel the need to get a general sense of the room you feel like you've only walked into it you haven't really got a sense for it and since you wandered close to the fire something glints above you and you look above the fire and um you see uh there's a 
a bronze. It seems bronze. Maybe it's just the fire. It's certainly metal. There's a bronze sickle and a bronze hammer crossed above the fireplace. And the, the hammer's a heavy, a heavy-looking hammer. And the sickle is it has not notches on it. Um, they cross there. It, it doesn't seem to be. I mean, it's clearly symbolic in some way, but it's also they look like they've been used. Um, there's notches on them, and uh, on the mantelpiece just below, there's a sort of bronze bowl in the same metal underneath them. Is there anything in the bowl? There's nothing in the bowl, but you can have a closer look at it if you'd like. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of inspect the, ba- the base of it and lift it up a bit. OK, so underneath you see... Um, it's, it's almost spiderweb-like. There's engravings on the bottom of the bowl. The rest of it is quite basic. On the bottom of the bowl, there's a sort of... It, it's almost like a spiderweb spreading outwards, um, mm. sort of carved into the, the bottom, and it seems to have certain indentations. It looks like there's an order to it, but it's such fine carving that you you can't place mm. any specific symbols just yet. It does, so it doesn't have any occult significance to me? Well, it may do. Shall I roll for a cult? I would, yeah. Um, As I'm doing this, I mutter, sort of half to to Ned, but not not really trying to get his attention. I just sort of say, it doesn't seem like the sort of house a Marxist would own, does it? Doctor, so Well, that's a 72, so I'm going to have a better look with this bowl. I'm going to hold it right next to the fire. Hope, you know, enough to get the metal hot if if I'm not careful. Um... (laughs) This is where you lose your face. <laughs> Burn my fingerprints off. <laughs> that might come in handy. <laughs> <gasps> Weirdly, exactly the same roll as last time. Very strange. But this a success. A hard success. Another oh, a hard 20, success. Another 21. So you are um, holding the bowl there. Um, you recognise it. It's, it's not a spider's web. It's not anything as random as that. It has a sort of... Strata coming out from the main, um, the main lines. Uh, you recognise it as. I don't know if you have any uh, Norse. Not really. I've got thirty-one percent in Latin. I nearly took Anglo-Saxon, but I didn't have enough. Ah. Well, I've 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 sort of implied enough there, so I'm going to say it's a symbol you have come across in the past, mm. and it was referred to you. I think it was while you were touring as uh, the ineffable Hypnos. Um, you met, you know, a few people selling scented candles and the uh, fucking odd bullshit like that. Uh, one of the gypsy families you met who were selling sort of magnetic bracelets, or so they claimed. Um, some of them had carved on them uh, the Vegsivir, which is the uh, the Viking compass, which mm. can represent a whole lot of things. It's quite a complex sort of compass symbol with, uh, you know, north, south, east, west, but, like, various intervals in between and various runes about it. And there's variations on it, so it's almost impossible to know what it might represent, but you have a feeling that that is what you're looking at, a sort of a sort of very thinly carved uh, Viking compass on the bottom of a bowl. There's nothing here, so. I say. <laughs> Turning from the desk. <laughs> I, um, what, well... Well, uh, Ned is looking at the desk. Uh, no, there's nothing here. I've just turned from the desk. <laughs> well, Ned is turning from the desk, and Sydney is. Uh, N- Ned's turning from the desk makes me just think I've just got to grab one of these books at random. I've, I've honed in on these books on um, the you know ancient pre-Roman history. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm going to do a I'm going to do a luck roll to see whether the book I grab at random is. Of interest. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. Please do. Uh, well, that's a hard success against my luck. In fact, that's nearly a... It's nearly an extreme success, but I'd leave it as a hard success, I think. Okay. Because I don't think I could spend luck against So luck what was it exactly account. you were looking for? I'm basically... So I've, you've, I've already realised that the books of interest are these books on uh, pre-Roman British history, Norse... Mm-hmm. Yeah. history and i'm i'm just basically going going for one the first one right. i grab and with um, a hard success you sort of pull this but it's, it's it is a book but it's almost a pamphlet 
um, just bound sort of loosely, like the pages would fall out. They almost do, but you sort of keep them together. Um, is it? Is it? Um, what's, what language is it written in? Uh, it's English. Oh, that's in fact, it's not a published book. It's something that seems to have been handwritten, um, and there are illustrations in it as well. And even with a hard success, you don't see... Botanical illustrations? I'm afraid not. We're not talking oh. the Voynich manuscript here. I put um, it back. <laughs> straight back on the shelf. <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> no, hang on to it. Well, so you, what, what, what you do see is this sort of... Uh, oh, what's the Ned, best way to say it? Ned, take a look at this. Is it, is it Romano-British? Uh, it's pre, pre-Romano-British. Mm. Mm. Latin? Oh, no, English, I see. No, it's in English. The language is in English and it looks modern, but the illustrations represent things other than that. Um, I might do maybe an, maybe an occult role. Oh, my occult is so bad. I'm going to do a... I mean, I can tell you what you see. Yeah. If you glean anything from it, that's your call, right. you know? Yeah. So um, there are pictures of... There's a lot of scribble-out writing... And there's pictures of sort of uh, figures, sort of quite squat figures without heads. Not cut off, just like sort of squat torsos and legs without heads. There's also figures of people um, who seem to be biting spheres or circles, sort of chewing into something. Some with a sort of mad face, just a row of teeth chewing into something. Um, And there are a, a, a certain amount of words just around the page crossed out. And one of them is bare, and the rest of them... I'll say you, you get the sense, even though you might not know all of the languages, that it might be a series of words of different languages for the word bear, and they're one by one being crossed out. Do we do we see okay. Ursa there? Yeah. yeah, and it's crossed out. Can I, do a, can I do a natural world role to see whether I have any knowledge about how recently there might have been bears in this part of Europe. Yeah. Uh, I'm just over. I'm going to spend four luck. So, you get the impression that, uh, well, well, at the time that, um, you know, if you're thinking Norse or you're thinking Saxon or anything, there's a possibility bears might have still been around in the UK. Certainly this looks relatively modern, this writing. So whatever's happened here is years after bears were present in the UK. Okay. Um, Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, this is some sort of interrogation or research into, well, you're not sure what. There's there's pictures of bearded men sort of gnawing at spheres and there's, uh, you know, a lot of words crossed out that are sort of linguistically linked to the word bear, but um, you're not sure why or for what purpose. It's a very small pamphlet. It's, it's among others. Okay. There's other stuff there, but since you got a hard success, that's that's what I can offer you right now, my friend. I have very little grasp <laughs> of what Cold World's library has to offer other than the book that um, Peregrine's shown me. So I'd like to make mm. a, a a brief uh, but Victorian and militarily inspired uh, mm. survey of of the library using my library use. Please do. So just to get a sense of what the sections are, yes, what, and, what might be... Uh, right, what right. Perry's been working through. Yes. That's a hard success. OK, so you get the sense that um, you, you, you're you following along behind Perry. Um, you're sort of seeing he's pulled out a lot of uh, pre-Roman Britain... Perry. Things. Perry. So, Perry. <laughs> Perry. <laughs> so you, you've noticed there's the Norse element, the pre-Roman Britain element... But you also, with a hard success on the rest of the library, realise, well, there's still a lot more in Latin and there's a lot more pertaining to other cultures around the world. So it isn't necessarily specific to that. That's the place he happened to reach. Um, You also see that there's a sort of leather-bound section slightly nearer the the left of the brazier, which has a... It looks like sort of portmanteaus or portfolios, um, which may be photo albums or maybe not. There might be legal documents or something, but it's slightly different to the rest of the library. Mm, OK, well, I'll probably check that out. Uh, but I'll, I'll just, before I do deep in, deep in the dive, dive into the deep, um, I, might, I might cast my eye over to the increasingly um, ineffable and inscrutable... Pissed. Wagner. 
and say, I say, Sydney, are you all right, old chap? I, I've got my, I've got my back to you. Then I turn round, holding this, holding this dish, uh, to show you the base of it, and then I say, I say, you two chaps don't know any connection, do you, between something like this, which is Norse, and any stories about bears? I know we've got that Bible reference. I don't suppose there's any mythological characters who transformed into bears or something like that, is there? Mm. In Norse mythology? In fact, I wonder if I could rack my own brains on that one with an occult role? Mm. And that, now you mention it, that does... I could Maybe I could check my education. That does ring a bell. I'm going to spend one luck and I'm going to pass that. Pass what? What did you pass? Occult. I got a 90. Fuck's sake. I got a hard success on my education in case I remember anything from my classics. I've got a feeling there's stories about people turning into animals, but I just can't remember. I would ask for a linguistics check, but I'm not sure that's a specific thing. Has anyone got linguistics or anthropology or anything? So I passed mm. the occult check. You passed the occult check. Um, so I've got... I mean, uh, I've got very high languages, specific languages, but maybe I could do a... Maybe if I did a hard success against one of my own languages. Maybe if you combine that with uh, Edward's success on the occult. Let's have a look. I start, dr- I start drifting on about... Well, of course, there are shape changes, uh, you know, the weird creatures. Old stories mm. handed down to scare people. Of course, when, when we arrived at the New World, that, that took on a whole... New aspect um, in relation to the uh, um, the native tribes people uh, with their quaint traditions of transformation into spirit animals, and I mean all of that is just uh, background noise. No, I've got I've got I've got a, a, a normal success against my language skills, but they're Latin and English. So would would pushing would pushing that occult role I just did help if I succeeded on? It might do if you combined it with um, Edwards. Yeah, because he had a you had a hard success, right, Edward? And no, just a success. Was just a, was just a, just a success. success. That's why I'm sort of wanting to see it a, a little bit more. Mix okay, it. Well, well, I'm going to push it a little bit. Um, by oh, how do I push this? Um, I'm going to smack myself on the head with the <laughs> with the bowl. Why don't you hypnotise me to see if I can remember anything from my fantastic idea? <gasps> Do the scene. Do the scene. I say, old chap, I say, old chap, I don't suppose you'd be willing to... You think you might remember something, but you can't remember it. I once had awful success uh, helping someone find their... um, find where their wife had been left. Um, Listen... Through hypnosis. Sydney, I'll be honest, this sounds an awful lot like those times at school when you... Copied my homework. Um, I, I think, as you know, I, 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 I study very hard, and um, if if uh, if there was something to be learnt, I learnt it. Maybe maybe it's there in the back of my mind somewhere. If you can feel you can safely, and I mean that safely, um, draw draw that out, then. I suppose I would be willing for you to attempt it. Excellent. Ooh, I suggest you sit down, make yourself comfortable, and um, just listen to my voice. <gasps> A hard success on my hypnosis. You're feeling very, very sleepy. <laughs> I, I whisper under my breath. Astra inclinat, <laughs> said non obligant. The stars incline us, they do not bind us. Quite right, too. Even if Ursa Major is shining over this house tonight. <laughs> Ursa Major! Uh, <laughs> um, as, uh, as Peregrine slips slightly out of his uh, conscious mind towards his subconscious, you do feel this sort of welling up of... And it was it's not a detailed thing, it's from one of your first classes in linguistics in general before they uh, siphoned you off towards Latin or Greek or whatever it was and it was an example by uh, one of the more fun tutors who uh, 
never was given a particularly good position at the school, but, you know, had a sort of... They had the joy de vivre, which uh, brought in students to the linguistic arts. And um, you remember a session of his particularly, and it's, it's aided by Edward in his uh, successful occult role. You hear him whisper as you go under, you hear him whisper, it was taboo, there was something taboo about this, there was something taboo. And as you're going under, that combined with your uh, successful role, you remember this lecture suddenly, where he, uh, and you're almost back in the room and you hear the, the tutor saying, uh, what is the word for bear? And uh, oh, sir. everyone sort of, well, no, what is the word for bear? Um, McCutcheon. Oh, oh, sir. I beg your pardon? Oh, sir. No, I'm not talking about Latin specifically now, McCutcheon. I'm talking about what is our English word for bear? Anyone? A bear? A sea of silence. McCutcheon says bear. No, you fool. <laughs> the word bear is a nothing. It is a place marker. It is a bookmark in the annals of our languages. The word bear no longer exists. Bear, in the Germanic, in the Norse tribes, was thought such a potent name, such a potentially magical name. Names being able to call creatures, beings, things. If you called them by their true name, they would appear. Leaf. No, no. He discovered Canada, perhaps, but Leif Erikson is far <laughs> from our minds at this point. Good guess, though, McCutcheon. Bear is a place marker. The real word for bear was too taboo, to the point where the northern tribes refused to use it in case it summoned the beast itself. Therefore, a place marker was put in linguistically, meaning the brown one. That is the only translation we have. Since then, all translations in every European language have come down from this cowardice to mean the brown one. The original word for bear is lost centuries ago. And that's why you should all take linguistics. Uh, it's a, one of those quirky things that's quite fun. Anyway, here's some finger sandwiches, and he sort of uh, moves across the room. <laughs> Party rings, anyone? Um, and you sort of uh, you come back, but you come back with the sense that you've sort of remembered something about the sort of the stranger natures of, of languages that you'd perhaps forgotten, and the fact that, yes, the word bear as we use it maybe is a a bookmark rather than a an actual name. The true word for bear is lost. Can I roll my Latin? Please do. To check regarding my etymology. The etymology of bear. Let me check my field guide. So I'm thinking, uh, so if Ursa Major, <laughs> where are the stars in relation to... Big bear. Bear. Because I, I couldn't afford the skill points for Greek. But I'm thinking sure. if I roll Latin... Okay, right. So I've got a hard success. It's not excellent, but it's a hard success on... Uh, actually, no. Actually, it's not quite. I've got to spend some luck for that. And what, yeah. what is it you're... Uh... So my Latin is 60. So I'm going to spend four luck for a hard success on Latin. And I want the etymology of the root of... Between between Bjorn, brown one, yes, and Ursa, Ursa, that's Arsa, that's Ars, Arca, Arca, <laughs> yes. Well, you so, want so, the... so, so I'm theorising with my occult success. Right. This is to do. This is to do with the northern constellation of of the of the bear Ursa. Of course. So is that the Arctic? That's what I'm thinking. Uh, Would we connect back to the Vikings? Connect back to the... Yeah, I mean, the uh, it's sort of slightly lost in the annals, like how far that was spread. I mean, it could just have been Norway. And I think it's more of a philosophical thing. It's less about the specificity of the language. 
And it's more about the fact that he's just remembered a lesson where he remembers that languages are sort of transient. And that's the important thing, rather than... You know, that combined with the paper he found earlier with the different languages of bear sort of crossed out quite violently. But it connects back to this bowl somehow, doesn't it? Well, it may do. But, um, you know, there's also other weird symbols everywhere that seem to be from every culture. There's sickles and hammers. I mean, that seems almost Soviet, even though that doesn't exist yet. Mm. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's various things. So, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you now, as me, as the DM, you happen to have picked up... <laughs> Various things that are very seem very specific to Norse culture, and I'm not saying it's not to do with that, but there are other pieces. While this is happening, while you and uh, Pippin, fool of a took, are uh, conversing, <laughs> and the well, the library falls down, the well, and the orcs arrive. Um, <laughs> Sydney, are you still sort of drinking? Uh, well, you've hypnotized. What do you do after? After he breaks mm. from the hypnotism and sort of once once he's brought back out, I'm I'm going to ring the bell. Excellent. Summon... Um, just before you do, could you give me a listen roll? Mm. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a narrow success. Nineteen so, twenty. Uh, uh, after you finish, you sort of you take a breath and you sort of move away from the fire, and you're sort of just existing on that left hand side of the study. As they sort of talk about uh, bear, yes, but there was something I remember my tutor saying bear. And uh, as they're talking, this sort of rhythmic sort of sound sort of pops into your head. This sort of <sighs> it sounds like panting. This sort of <sighs> um, and uh, you turn and you realise it's coming from the the open door. the The door is still slightly open. Can you give me a spot hidden check, please? <laughs> this would be an awful room to be mauled by a bear. <laughs> oh. The perfect room to be mauled by a bear in. Very hard to escape a windowless room full of books and yeah. fire. <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we might manage to set oh. it on fire. <laughs> so I, on my 50 spot hidden, I've rolled... A seven, an extreme success. Ooh, I thought it was the other way around. You hear, as they're talking around you, you sort of, you hear this <sighs> rhythmic sort of guttural sort of breathing. I brush the, I brush the, I brush the, the fringe this... of my capuche on a side. Absolutely. <laughs> and you turn towards, and it's only a sliver of the door that's open, but there's immediately two points of light, and you realise that it's a glint from the one point of light, the fire grate in the study and there's these two points of light moving up and down and as your sort of eyes focus you see a face that is horribly distended it seems um, almost as if the jaw is hanging far too loosely and the sort of sliver of a tongue hanging out of it and you see this sort of like the scraps of hair and the eyes become sort of quite yellow in the thing. And you see it hanging, and teeth suddenly appear. <laughs> and the door pushes open slightly. <laughs> and, I, um, I scream, I scream. You scream. This was an Apocalypse Players production. For more information about the podcast, go to apocalypseplayers.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>